Today on May 30th, 2007, with Lieutenant Colonel Elmo Geppel. He was a navigator on a B-24 in the 458th Bomb Group, 755th Bomb Squadron of the 8th Air Force, stationed at Horsham, St. Faith, England during World War II. And I'd just like to start out and ask you, where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was at school at Kansas University, going through engineering school and teaching drafting to Navy machinist mates training school, and looking to finish school, mm -hmm. at least finish that year. Uh, shortly after that, the um, aircraft companies in Wichita uh, started a women's technical training program because they were short of technical educated people. And I had been teaching blueprint reading and drafting, and they came to me and wanted to know if I would like to go to work for them. I, standard wage in those days was 50 cents an hour, about anything around school. I was making 75 with the Navy and just thought I was in cloud nine, and they were offering a dollar and a quarter and teaching gals. So, you know where I went. So I taught them for several months, and... Uh, as I said, really had expected that I'd finish uh, that uh, year of school. And uh, the summer before, I had worked for Phillips Petroleum Company in Okmulgee, Oklahoma. My parents lived in Tulsa. And I figured I was better off to register for the draft uh, in Tulsa than in a little town of Okmulgee, which was a mistake, because all the folks in Tulsa that come up uh, subject to being drafted, would go out and go to work for a aircraft plant here, Air Force Plant 2 was here, and be uh, uh, exempt. So the local draft board was really having trouble getting their quota, and the fact I was in school or the fact I was even teaching the Navy didn't mean anything. One day I get a notice of a 1A, and uh, so I had been talking to various of the teams on campus because they were enlisting a lot of people and uh, Navy in fact had offered me a uh, first class petty officers to join the Navy but I wanted to fly and I was a double E graduate and the Army Air Corps had a radar officer on flying staff. So that did my electrical engineering background and got me to fly and that was what I was interested in. So when I got this 1A notice, uh, the enlistment team was still there on campus, and I went back to talk to them again, and uh, and he said, oh, have, have you talked to your uh, military advisor, who happened to be the registrar of the university? And I said, yes, I talked to him a couple times, too, about various ones. And he said, well, the reason is that enlistments have closed unless you have previously indicated a an interest. But if you can go over and see him, if you have talked to him, he'll give you a letter of the fact that you have and you can still get in. And the other part of it is though that they're giving the last examination at the courthouse in Kansas City tomorrow. So you can you get up there that way or by then? And I said, well, yeah, it's a train at 8 o'clock. I can make that. So uh, he said, oh, also you'll have to have three letters of recommendation. So run around here some of your professors or somebody tonight and get them. So, anyway, we went saw the registrar and he hollered at one of the girls to stay long enough to type him a letter and I went and got my letter. I usually was the one in our house to wake people up. We all slept in a couple sleeping porch rooms and that morning I woke up, it was ten minutes after eight. I uh, jumped up, saw the clock, and again, ran at the phone because in those days with all the snow and so forth, trains were running late, so I called to see what the train was, and it was about an hour and 15 minutes late. So, okay, so I grabbed my clothes and get to the train station and get to Kansas City, and everything's fine. So, and took, the phys took the exam and passed it, and they sent us over to Fort Leavenworth for physicals, and uh, went through that, went back to Kansas City, and you had to be sworn in by midnight of that week, Friday night of that week. So 
So this was like Tuesday, I think it was. We got came back and. Uh, now and this is all training uh, exams to become a pilot. Is that right? Oh, this is just to join the Air Corps. Just to join cadet, the Air Corps. Yeah, just gotcha. Cadet. Okay. And uh, so I started processing all of us and. I don't know how many, two or three hundred sitting around the hallways of the courthouse waiting to be called up by the sergeants and, and uh, being good or bad, my personality is rather than sitting still, I'd rather be doing something. I asked the sergeant if I anything I could do to help and they were short-handed and, oh yeah, yeah, you, you know, so sat down at the table. So for two days I sitting there with them waiting for them to call my name as well as got down to Friday. Still hadn't come up with me, my papers. I started look, some looking for them, and uh, the major in charge of it uh, had looked and found the three to five card record where I'd passed both physical and mental tests and what have you, and talked talk, told me on the side. He said that if they found the papers or not, he'd swear me in before the, the night before they quit that night. So I sweat it, but. Mm -hmm. I kept looking, and as it got towards the end, they, weren't any, uh, they had more time, and uh, one of the major sergeants called me and said, didn't I write you a letter? And I said, a letter for what? And he said, well, it seems like, I said, let me know, I'll, I'll find out, I'll call the front house. And he had, that I, uh, going on flying status, had to have an additional test that the others didn't have. And uh, we didn't know why that was different because we're all going to fly supposedly, but there's something there. So, and Leavenworth, where we had our physical, was closer to Kansas University than Kansas City was. So he had just told, written me to tell me that and to tell me to go back to Leavenworth to do the other test and the team there, which had my papers and was processing. Mm -hmm. So he said, what you need to do is just go on back over to Leavenworth. Well, having the major told me that you know, if I stood there, stayed there, we're going to be there. He'd swear me in. But I said, let's be sure that they got them and everything clear before I make another trip. So he called and they did have them. So I went, got grabbed the bus and went over to Leavenworth and went in. I processed uh, and they started packing up. And I said, you all going back to Kansas City? He said, oh yeah. And I said, well, can I ride? My baggage and everything's still in the hotel over there. So <laughs> I, we were packing up typewriters and all the other equipment and just about everything in the two vans. And here come a young lad down, running down the street and looking for the Air Force team. And uh, talking to the sergeant that was in charge of it. And I, here part of it that he'd been on his way to Leavenworth as the letter had told him to and his car broke down. Oh. And some farmer had agreed to bring him on after hearing his story, bring him on into the, to the fort. But he couldn't come on base so they had to let him out at the front gate. And he'd been running in from the front gate, you know, realizing the time was getting close to business day over. So, uh, Sergeant said, if you want to be in the Army Air Corps that bad, guys, unload a typewriter. We're going to swear this fellow in. So I was the next to last one in Wyandotte County, Kansas, to be sworn into the Army Air Corps. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we went back, went back to school, and they called up a bunch of us in December. This is December of? 40, 40, 42. 42, okay. 42. And... Uh, Went to Jefferson Barracks, St. Louis, for basic training. Uh, this was when, during the time that Walter Winchell dubbed it Pneumonia Gulch. We ran right there on the river in the cold and the what have you, and most everybody had the flu. Had, had, to, had to have 103 temperatures to be admitted to the hospital because they were so crowded. Uh, I uh, managed that, but with that, the word got out that we were going to either go to some university in South Dakota, I think it was, or Washington University in St. Louis. And just about the whole 
majority of the crowd, no way did they want to go to Washington University in St. Louis. But being one that there wasn't officially anything you could do about it but moan and it wasn't going to help any. So. Why not? Why did they want to go to Washington University? Oh, because of the weather and the see it's right there in town, same climate and same yeah. experience. They thought that we had experienced out there at Jefferson Barracks, which is right on the edge of the river. Of course, I would think Washington South Dakota the winters could be just as bad. I'm sorry? I would think the South Dakota winter could be just as bad. Well, it could be, but not <laughs> damp and, and wet. Anyway, Hey, we, uh, I ended up going in. It ended up that the facility at uh, Washington University, uh, the whole campus was our limits. And on the campus was the gym, the women's quarters, uh, the union building, uh, and, or I said women's quarters, women's dorm. Uh, so, you know, we had everything that you wanted. You could have a date, go to the union, so forth, and you still was on base. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were we were got there with uh, I think two sergeants of the advance party coming to set up the unit. So we were the first ones there, and they say we got there before the staff really got there. And uh, uh, there for a couple of days with the two or three rest of them coming in, equipment and what have you, and hadn't had any mail in for almost a week. And, some of the guys were really complaining about, when are we going to get our mail? And we had to be eating dinner one night with one of the sergeants, and some of them come up to bug him about it. And he said, it's all over there in the room. It's, you're going to have to wait till we can get time. There's other things we got to do before we can put on it. Some of you guys want to volunteer to go do it. You can, you know, we do that, but it's just got to be sorted and the mail room set up and the mail all sorted. So three or four of us kind of looked at each other, oh, we'll do that. So we went over and did that, and they found out I could type. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the biggest reason, but shortly afterwards we tried out for cadet officers and to get the organization militarily formed, and uh, I tried out for a uh, squad leader, and I uh, already had never done any marching or commanding or so forth at that time. and. Uh, uh, didn't didn't do a whole lot. Didn't expect to be of anything. Came the day uh, end of the week when they announced uh, cadet officers. I turned out to be group adjutant. So I, again, I, I've always said because I could type. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, was there for uh, um, that week or so. We ne we had ne never none of us had yet had a, a pass to go off base and uh, they in the meantime had formed intramural baseball teams between the uh, different uh, squadron but the ball diamond was actually across the street which was off base and they couldn't go over there you know other than officially when they went, did, went over for PT or something and play ball. Oh, so they had a big game plan for that Saturday even though it was the first weekend that we were going to have passes to go to town, and uh, I had to call all formations, and I had to be in uniform. And I, last I remember, was pitching the glove I had to somebody and heading towards the barracks to get my get tell me that one of the fellas hit a beautiful pop-up fly, but a new bat wasn't taped, and it caught me in the temple oh. and knocked my nose off my face. And uh, I woke up over in the infirmary. Uh, incidentally, one of the new young cadets never had had any training, but four hours of first aid that he that he'd had so far being there was the first to think to get my pressure points and probably kept me from bleeding to death. Wow! Till a little more professional got a hold of, but <clears throat> got over. And as I said, I woke up in the infirmary for a little bit, was numb, and really didn't know a whole lot. And could remember halfway waking up in the ambulance on the way back up to JB Hospital and was out there for a few weeks to uh, all swell or I guess uh, all swelled up. No, it was this side, all swelled up. Uh, finally got got it in fact got it cleared and 
went back to back in time to stay with the unit to go on to classification with the same bunch. Mm -hmm. Got the classification where we had to choose between pilot, bombardier, and navigator. Mm -hmm. It was emphasized that we should all be uh, pilots, and again, I was not aware of how much better off I would have been in the future for promotion and other activities, being a pilot and commander, but uh, had had a legal choice to uh, right to, to choose, and uh, oh, I, I skipped the fact in basic, I was supposed to go from basic to Scott Field for my radar training and switch over to, to that unit. And I went down to headquarters the third week, as I'd been told to do by the enlistment team, and Sergeant Major says, boy, that enlistment team sure pulled one on you, sir. You, you might as well figure out whether you're going to be a pilot, bombardier, or navigator, because you're going with this bunch of San Antonio classification. And uh, so when we got to, uh, to San Antonio classification, again, why not being happy just sitting around doing nothing and having been a cadet officer there for a while, I went in and asked if I could help anything and anyway and uh, so first lieutenant or squadron commander needing help and uh, so I uh, took over as uh, uh, I forget what the first job was but in for a short while did something else there filing or what have you and then the ship the fellow that had been doing uh, the uh, duty clerk uh, job of signing folks to KP and to guard duty and what have you uh, left and it was a thankless job and half the time the fellows didn't show up they just ignore it and they were having trouble getting enough help at KP and what have you and the lieutenant asked me if I'd take it and we'd been talking just before he asked me the fact that the uh, young man that was a cadet that was uh, past clerk was shipping out, going to, going to be shipping out, and that was a that was a pretty nice job. I mean, folks always coming in wanting to get their passes to go to town mm -hmm. and what have you. And having had that kind of knowledge just prior, it, it hit me, and I said, "Tell you, Lieutenant, I'll make you a deal. I'll take the duty clerk job if you'll also make me pass clerk." And he immediately understood what I was thinking. So we didn't have any trouble with having duty clerks the rest of the time we were at San Antonio. <laughs> but anyway, I uh, I was uh, classified as a navigator. My choice, one of few that weren't uh, didn't go to pilot training or uh, to or that or were grounded. Mm -hmm. uh, we shipped to Ellington Field, Texas, uh, just out of Houston, where I had gone to high school. And uh, for pre-flight, uh, the main memory of that is while the several weeks there for pre-flight, I was a squadron uh, leader, squad leader. But we experienced uh, my first and only hurricane. Mm -hmm. We had 120 some mile an hour winds come across the field, and uh, <coughs> I had uh, all of us out on the, the line with four or five people on each wing of our little planes to keep them on the ground because even them tied down it uh, wasn't enough and uh, of course the eye went across the field and a good many of them whew, it's over no fellas it's only half over you're gonna have about 30 minutes you're gonna have the same thing again so we went through that and the rebuilt rebuilding then afterwards uh, some damage and, and then went to San Marcos, Texas for advanced trading and my commission and, and was assigned to uh, a, a group at, at, to report to Blythe, California. And the group was already there in training, short of navigators, waiting for our graduating class. And mm -hmm. So they'd gone partway through the, the training for overseas that uh, they were going through there when I joined them. Uh, part of uh, that also interesting enough I think story is about halfway through navigation training 
our instructor, each instructor had three crews of three cadets each that he flew with. And our instructor went down in a crash with one of the other units and was killed. And we went through the last half of our half training without really any critiques or knowing of what we could do for each other, whether we were doing what we were supposed to be doing or what, you know, what to do different. So they didn't replace your instructor? What? No. They didn't replace him? Huh? Well, different ones flew with us. They were replaced by others p picking us up, but there wasn't any con continuity between them and no building or report to really feel like you were, you know, close to mm -hmm. hearing what, <laughs> what the truth was. Mm -hmm. So I, we were really sweating out graduation, but we did make it. So the day I got my wing, I got my commission wings, I went back by the orderly room to clean out my desk and pick up my stuff. And our squadron commander happened to be there, and only a couple of other fellows were doing the same thing, and they left. And, and uh, he said, Capelt, I want you to know that uh, I uh, really voted against you graduating. I'm afraid you're going to go out and kill somebody. And, uh, oh, yeah. He said, you know, you were kind of marginal on a lot of your things. And, well, you know, I, we really didn't have any way of knowing what we were doing, but uh, I think I understand what it's all about. And, uh, so that uh, in the back of my mind, you know, for a while. So I get out to Blythe and meet the crew and meet Rumby, our pilot, and, and get caught up with the things that uh, were required there, and, uh, like qualifying with 45. And I'd had a little bit of firearms growing up, rifles more than anything, but uh, so talking about us, asking the rest of them, you know, well, what, what do you got to know, and besides stripping it and, you know, dressing it and what have you, and they said, well, go down and see Gardner and get his notebook. Uh, Gardner was our ball turret gunner, was the oldest man on flying status of the U.S. Army Air Corps had been overseas during World War I for a short while, reportedly lying about his age. <laughs> you added that up with what his record showed, what he told us, and none of them coincided. We really never knew how old Wells Gardner was. <laughs> but anyway, I went over to Leslie Men's quarters <coughs> on that suggestion and hardly knew the guys yet. Asked for Gardner and they double-decker bunks like we used in those days. And so on the bottom of the flats of the upper bunk was a couple boards went across and a good place to stash stuff. And he was in a lower bunk and he reached up and pulled out a notebook made out of half sheets of notebook paper stapled together or paper clip, uh, bratted together. And I took them and read through them and went and passed the test. I mean, it, it was excellent. <laughs> So uh, uh, we finished uh, our uh, <coughs> things like that, and then they came up to like, oh, pilot and I were supposed to fly an extended overseas mission because it was expected that we'd go to the Pacific and be flying the Pacific on the, uh, the trainer they had, and were actually, I mean, it was. It was an excellent trainer. It was just like the real thing. I was up above and uh, pilot down below and only communication by the intercom. And uh, so it was about a 10 hour mission. So we wow. we threw the whole thing. And I come back down the steps and so forth when it was over. And Sarge uh, uh, looked up when I came in. He said, congratulations, sir. Thank you. And I said, why, why that? And he says, you were one minute and less than one mile, probably one of the best flights that's been flown here in months. Wow. So I have my confidence back. <laughs> I mean, that's redeeming, yeah. isn't it? And Bert and I learned right then. I mean, that we were a team. We could work together. Mm -hmm. so. Good for you. Uh, we shipped out uh, 
from there finished uh, uh, basic tra or that overseas training. It was at the summer coming on. The asphalt landing strip that they had would not support bombers in the summertime. So they moved the bomber group to Walla Walla, Washington and some fighter group came in and we went up to Hamilton Field to, to go overseas. And every day a crew took off and circled the Golden Gate Bridge and opened their orders and found out where they were going. And we were two days from being on the list to leave and Brumby uh, happened to be up at headquarters and uh, for say about something and the flight surgeon was there and he says, Lieutenant, what's wrong with your hands? And Bert had some breaking out on his hands that uh, had developed and uh, flight surgeon says, you aren't going anywhere that, especially South Pacific that way, you're grounded. So, report to, you report to hospital in the morning and we've got to start treating that. So we were there for, I don't know, several days waiting for Bert to get well and what have you. And uh, he came back one afternoon and said, pack up guys, we're supposed to go get, get on a train at 2 o'clock. Train? Where are we going? I understand, I mean, we'll get orders shortly, they'll be down with them, but I understand we're headed to the East Coast and going to Europe. So that was when you first knew you were yeah. going to the yeah. European theater and Pacific and theater. I really don't remember exactly when we knew uh, where we were going, but uh, we did, we got on train, made across the country, and uh, ended up Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, and I was there for two or three days, and uh, uh, many of the fellows uh, called, have their wives and families and what have you come up because we would have we, were, we could have passes, and well, again, being officers, as long as you weren't duty, you could go. So uh, I had uh, my fiance, Kansas City, called her, and she decided to come up and. Uh, one of the other fellows had a, a wife and a young and he'd never seen from Florida. And we <coughs> arranged for the girls to have a room together in some hotel. And <coughs> the morning that they were to arrive, and we were to go see them that afternoon. At Reveille, we were told that we were on orders for shipping and uh, the, there would be no communications, you know, anything, you know. You tell well, what do we do? Well, you can tell the Red Cross, and the Red Cross will get word to your parties to, that you're not coming to go. So, a num number of the fellows that lived in the area had found that there was a big hole in the back fence that had been going home about every night, those few nights we were there, and, and I was ready to. And so the fellow said, you know, they throw the book at you now. You're, no way. So, okay, he convinced me, and so I started looking for any way to get there otherwise or do anything. And learned that uh, they would pick a cadre of about 10 officers to go on board early to learn the ship and help with loading. And I had a little bit of advantage that I had been active in sea scouting the years I lived in. Houston and uh, Galveston Bay and knew a little bit about ships and then and again uh, two or three occasions had some association with the Navy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I volunteered and went to find him to tell him, hey we got to leave away because I understand that a good part of the time with that small quadri once they get on board they let's go to town that night. So couldn't find him anywhere. Yeah. So, packed my stuff up and went, went on. When I boarded that evening was the last time I set the foot on the ground until I got there. <laughs> we didn't get to go to town. Oh. <laughs> Red Cross had hit word to Betty to go home and I wasn't going to be there. But, and unfortunately his wife got bumped on his way flying up. He did go to town to meet, to, he never made, made connection with Betty. I guess she'd already left, but mm. 
Uh, he didn't get to see his wife either because she got bumped on the way up from trying to fly up from Florida. And he came back and made it okay. But, but uh, anyway, that's part of stories of life. Mm -hmm. uh, had uh, the cruise over on one of the new troop carrier ships. It was very close together, kind of close quarters, but very nice. Mm -hmm. Made a good trip. Oh, interesting part of that too is uh, uh, we were advised that we were supposed to carry our sextants rather than pack them in our B4 bags or ship them because they might you know, get damaged and out of calibration. So, being a good little boy that I was in those days, I was boarded the ship carrying my little, looks like a little briefcase and a little box. And, and uh, again, as I said, having had the days of the Sea Scout, when I boarded ship, just automatically, I was saluted twice as, you, as a naval custom, and this, uh, 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 I think it was rank, anyway, officer said, Hey, Lieutenant, where did you learn the Navy? And I told him, Sea Scouts, and we visited a little bit. He said, What you got in the box? I said, Well, that's my sextant. That, uh, and uh, he happened to be the ship's navigator and was interested because they always use a rising sections. And uh, he said, well, I'll tell you, after we get out the second day, come on up and, and visit. I said, we've already been told that, you know, the bridge is off duty, off. Uh, he said, we see that stairway right over there. There'll be a Marine. They had Marines on his uh, car duty. So there will be a Marine on that step, but you just ask him to call up and, yeah, and, and I'm there a good part of the time if I am not come back later, but if I am, I'll I mean, pass you up. So we went a couple of days out. I, I did that, went up and went up, visited with him, got acquainted with their facilities and what have you. And a couple of days after that, I went up and there weren't any any fixes. It was all dead reckoning. I said, what's the problem? He says, there's no horizon. It was all foggy and couldn't see the horizon. The sky was clear. And uh, I said, we'll take the sun shot. And he said, there's no horizon. Oh, that's right. Let me go get my sextant. So I went down and got my sextant. We came up and we shot several fixes that afternoon and plotted them. And we were right on course. But he says, you know, I bet I get called on the carpet for this. Why? That I'm the only one in the convoy that's going to have any fixes this afternoon. <laughs> I want to know what I've been drinking. <laughs> so, it was about the only occasion. Uh, Rumby and I made it a point to pretty well explore the ship and just out of curiosity and down in the engine room and all the rest. And as long as you visit it and ask ahead of time or what have you, you do a lot of things. So, mm -hmm. we uh, had a, really had a pretty good cruise over. And, no major excitement as far as the enemy was concerned. It was a pretty large convoy and pretty well uh, supported mm -hmm. uh, battleships and what have you. So we got to uh, Scotland and down to Stone Redistribution. And then we were sent to over to Ireland for uh, holding to, and I guess a little bit of indoctrination training, but. Uh, the uh, navigator that I'd grown up with, another G, uh, was in joining crew, and he and I ran around a lot together, and did so over there. And one day we were out, uh, just goofing off, but somehow or other got acquainted with the sergeant that made the assignment. So where you went? So we asked him. He said, "How do you, you know, how do you decide who goes where?" He said, well, I go down here and it says it needs three crews, and I go down this list and take three crews. And it says two crews, and I take two crews. He said, you got somewhere you want to go, and there's a vacancy. I'll put you there. He said, I, I don't know any, any of them or any different. And I said, well, which, you know, what, what do you know about the different fields? And he says, well, you know, not a whole lot about them. But I've heard of Horsham St. Faith is right on the edge of Norwich. The city bus runs by the front gate. It's permanent buildings, it's got steam heat. I said, you don't need to say any more, put us down. <laughs> so we 
went back to tell the crew what we'd found out that most of the fields over there were in constant huts with the little coal stoves in the middle that, mm. you know, red hot, they might warm that side of you. <laughs> and uh, um, so, thought it was well. Only problem was that Gin's pilot was a fatalist. He didn't want anybody to, or anything to do anything that would decide or make, he just wanted it to be fake. So he went to tell the sergeant that he didn't want to be specifically assigned to Norwich. Well, again, being commander of the troop, the sergeant, you know, deliberately didn't send him out to one of the other fields where Quonset Huts were and what have you. But anyway, we ended up with Horsham and with all of the the pluses of, <laughs> that were there, <laughs> and it, it was, we had, uh, it, we were actually housed in a house that had been made for a British family in the days of being an uh, uh, English RAF base, mm -hmm. and uh, I think we had four crews of officers, so most cases that would have been just four officers. In, in in the house, each mm -hmm. each crew had a room. We had two double decker bunks, and you know four of us slept in one, one room. But uh, had uh, uh, private listed men that kept the house and kept did the cleaning and, mm -hmm. and did that. But we managed to live fairly comfortably. Mm -hmm. It was rather unique because again we still had that early day difference between the ground officers of the Army and the Air Corps officers of the Army. And of course the first thing was the steel bands and the hats, you know, the air crew wore your, wearing your he headphones over them, the steel bands were in the way, so it became style to wear your hat without a band in it. And then the Army guy boys didn't like that. Everything, you know, supposed to have been sharp. It was good. Always continuous uh, argument between, them. but uh, we flew our our fourth mission. Flew on our fourth mission. Uh, the mission was scrubbed or kind of weather was recalled. Uh, in accordance with standard procedure, the command pilot uh, could pick a target of opportunity, and uh, ours picked. Heligoland, which was the island where Germany kept all their submarines. And it was probably the most heavily armed few square miles of anywhere in Germany. And we had a lot of uh, flak. There was one piece of flak that came in just on each side of the B-24, pilot and co-pilot side, it was a piece of armor plate more or less to protect them from any uh, explosions out there. But one piece of flak got in just in front of the armor plate on Brumby's side and caught him right there in the steering wheel at the same time, uh, which stopped it. We drew a line afterwards from the hole to where the steering wheel probably would, have, would be in normal flight. And if the steering wheel hadn't been there, it would have caught the co-pilot somewhere in here. But as it was, it got Bert's hand, uh, a lot of red blood, but not a major wound. But uh, on the 24, my desk was in the nose, riding backwards, looking at the pilot and co-pilot's knees and feet. Mm -hmm. The controls and all were between us, but I could see them. And just red all over everything, you know, where the radio operator was the official first aid person on each crew. But in my scouting and other growing up, I'd had a lot of first aid training, and we were again that, that at that time uh, just another crew following. So I didn't mean a problem of leaving for a while. So I beat it to the flight deck to see what was going on and mm -hmm. uh, take care of his wound a little bit. But uh, co-pilot dropped back out of formation where he could see then and took over and flew us back to the field on the other side of the formation, happened to be on where he could 
So we got back in, got Bert in the hospital, and you know, it was a minor wound. Uh, name your friend in Houston had seen the steering wheel. I've seen it. Oh, you've seen it. Okay. Seen it, yeah. I, I managed to, was talking to our crew chief you know, a few days afterwards and uh, talked about, you know, taking it. He had the the uh, handle wheel replaced and so forth. I said, what'd you do with the old one? He said, oh, threw it, you know, threw it in the scrap box. box. And I went and dug it out. And we had, I already had the piece of flat. And so I ended up and mounted a piece of flak and plexiglass, I believe, or somehow, anywhere in the center of that wheel and then gave it to Bert. But it was during those several days that he was in the hospital that uh, they came and asked Bert if he wanted to be a lead crew pilot. He had been already com commended for his formation flying. But he'd fly a lot steadier. If the lead ship is doing this, these guys back here are more concerned at being in too close. Mm -hmm. If you're steady and you feel comfortable of, of staying in tight and you got a lot more firepower. Mm -hmm. And our fighters did the same thing as enemy fighters did. They picked groups that were scattered because they got less folks shooting at them. Mm -hmm. So we actually flew the balance of our tours and never had a fighter attack. Wow. I've seen them. We've seen them come at it, be all over the sky. I've called for fighter support two or three occasions when I think they were coming after us, but again, they'd always pick on, they'd be somebody else up there that had lesser concentration than we did, and uh, again, I became allergic to flak on that fourth mission. My next mission, I was a lead navigator. Our intelligence was excellent. I spent hours studying maps, and I stayed away from it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a lot, a lot of around us, I mean, there's still some up there, but we stay away from the heavy concentration. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I got home, probably several months after the, the war and being home, that it finally dawned on me that my experience wasn't even anything like my own crew members. But I was busy with my head in charts or equipment the whole time, and one of the duties was to make, for our intelligence, was to make notes anytime we had fighter attack or had um, ACAC, uh, anti-aircraft fire or what have you. That's how they got the information to feed back to us. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> with my responsibilities, rather than the guys trying to tell me when it happened, I'd have them make notes of it and when I'd get a few minutes, I'd say, okay guys, give me your reports. And so they'd tell me, you know, 20 minutes ago, 18 minutes ago we had this, 15 minutes ago we had this, such and such a time we had this, I'd write it down. And as I say, I realized it wasn't like even my own guy sitting there watching that puff out there and wondering whether the next one was going to be under your seat or not, mm -hmm. or whether that guy was going to come in to, to our group and be shooting at us rather than that plane over there. Mm -hmm. I didn't ever have any of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just a job, an enjoyable job too. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, we did, as I say, go through it without any major, finished our 30 tours and 30 missions in our tour and, uh, uh, and headed for home. Or the rest of the crew had been off for various reasons uh, and we didn't quite all finish at the same time and uh, they had a couple other missions to attend, so Rumby and I were on orders then to come home together. Mm -hmm. And we went back up to Stone, this redistribution station, and we're there for a few days. And I came in from, or we came in from being out sightseeing or something that afternoon, and had orders on my bunk to report to headquarters. And went over to find out what, and the sergeant says, oh, sorry, you need to go get packed up. You're supposed to catch train up to, uh, uh, Air Base in Scotland, I remember the name of it now, uh, such, and that, such and such hour. I said, Sarge, the only ones that are flying home are those that have signed up for uh, another tour or going home on emergency leave, and I'm neither one. And he said, all I know, sir, is your own orders to go up there and fly to go back and back. <laughs> 
So I did. I went and got well, that's where I left Brumby then. He mm -hmm. had to wait for a convoy and come home by ship, but got up to, to the field and uh, signed in and uh, was told that we'd be signed the ship uh, as the seat came available mm -hmm. and uh, might be that evening or the next day. So I got in a bridge game and a bunch of three or four others and playing cards and uh, middle of the afternoon uh, Every evening it came time that bar opened, so we went to have a drink and got there and there was a, a, a Navy crew came in. And they, as all the rest, were giving their navigator a hard time and and so I butted into it. They were standing right beside of me and I butted into it and I said, Commander, if you take oh in the meantime I buddied up during this card game with a uh, two different officers, a second lieutenant and a major that were coming home on emergency leave. And uh, I said, you take the three of us home, I'll guarantee, I'll navigate for you and I guarantee you will get home. So, you know, we yakking back and forth. <laughs> Finish that, so I'd go back to the card game and went back and played for a little while longer and then I excused myself. I said, I've had enough guys, I'm going to go see what else I can find. I walked out the door and kind of looking around the lobby and there was commanders the other side of the room saw me. <laughs> beckoned me. So I walked over to see what he wanted. He said, we just got our uh, our ship assigned and we got a bunch of extra room. If you can clear the army, you can go with us. And they said, we happened to be standing right there with the sergeant's desk and the sergeant heard it and I said, Sarge, how do we do that? He said, sign this paper and go get your bag. Okay. <laughs> so I said, what about the other guys? So we went and got them. So we got we signed our papers, we got our bag, and we went on out the plane with them. And uh, it was a uh, DC-4, a DC-50, uh, remember my plane number? 50, the big oh, the C cargo plane. Mm -hmm. C-47? What was the bigger one? So the C-54? Is that what it was? Anyway. Yeah, I don't know. And so we get, we get on, and, you know, bucket seat. Well, that was something else that one of the army guys would give and he says, well, you know, that'll be bucket seats, and, you know, you wait till tomorrow, we'll, give, we'll probably have one with you with with cushion seats in it. Well, we, we'll go tonight. So we got on, and sure enough, it was bucket seats, so we didn't, we weren't complaining. Big pile of mail on the other side of the plane, mail bags. So we're sitting there, getting acquainted a little bit more, who, where we were from, where they were going, and what have you, and uh, Navy captain comes on board. And we introduced ourselves and visited. And, and uh, oh, now I got ahead of my start. First, the truck backed up and moves in two sections of three uh, posted seats on each section, or a total of six seats. And, and bolts and straps them down, pass them down on the side of the plane. And, and uh, one of them says, Here, you guys, this will be better than those bucket seats. Okay, you're fine. So then pretty soon here comes a car and staff car and the captain comes on board. Now we know why the seats were put on. So Navy captain comes on and you know introduces and you know, get acquainted and getting ready to take off. Shortly after we take off the uh, I can't think what they call him, but like a steward and uh, uh, does everything on the plane, loadmaster and what have you. Came back and said, Captain, uh, uh, condolences from the pilot. Wouldn't you like to come up and take one of the two bunks? And there's two bunks up in front for the crew to alternate off on to sleep in. So, oh yeah, that'd be fine. Thank you. So he goes forward. So uh, the Navy went, why well, I can't think of their title, but anyway, he came back. He says, uh, whenever you fellows are wanting to go to bed, uh, let us know. I'll fix your, I'll fix your bunk or fix your bed. Yeah, I said, "What are you talking about?" He says, "Oh, we got air mattresses and bedding and so forth, and up there on top of the mailbags, really, they make a pretty good bed." I said, "Well, we're in no hurry, but you know, whenever it's convenient for you, you just you know, go ahead and fix them." So he comes back and puts out the air mattresses and sheets and the whole bed and. Uh, we pull off our shoes and our pants, and I mean, I slept most of the way home. 
<laughs> or most of the way to uh, uh, oh the island in the uh, halfway across the road. Iceland? No, south of there. Boy, Newfoundland? No, no smaller, smaller island. island. Anyway, it, it was it had about all it had on it was a landing strip and an illusion of an illusion. Been a while. That's the problem getting old too, my memory. <laughs> but anyway, we, we stopped stopped there for refueling and you know, and we got into Patuxent, Maryland, then and, and one of these other uh, fellows is uh, from New York. And the other one was not too far from there, and. Uh, we could have gone into Washington D.C. to report in, but they talked me into. They, we had to all go together and say, you know, they wouldn't stand up. But if, if we go in, if we report into Fort right up in, in here, New York, that uh, you know, I'd give them a couple extra days. Mm -hmm. Though I hadn't seen, never seen New York, so I that agreed. So went into New York and then. And went on, came on home. Uh, trying to think where we go from there. Um, well, I have a couple questions. If, yeah. if you have a second, yeah. um, how do you think that uh, you know, looking back on your military experience, you know, during mm -hmm. the war? Did, how did that affect your life after that? Did it have any impact on you as a person? No, other than uh, the time that I, because I did get in the reserve and mm -hmm. was quite active with it and on staff. And, uh, but uh, as uh, yeah. you know, flying with Bert with uh, with through pilot Bert Brumby. Um, he was the lead pilot, as you told yeah. me, on, on a number of the missions. What, what sort of responsibilities did that entail, being the lead pilot? Well, or the lead plane, I guess you know. Uh, really, I think only the standpoint of being a plus that it flying steady allowed the others to close in, and you had better formation, better bomb drop, better bomb pattern. But uh, job responsibilities. Uh, I know no, no difference. What was probably uh, what what was probably your most harrowing experience on some of your missions? Was it the flak hitting the? the well, boat? When he, the time he was hit. Mm -hmm. Oh, one of the things on that too was we got over in the hospital. Then a couple of days later, he said something about uh, pelt was too long for the crew. I soon got dubbed Geep. So as far as the bomber crew is concerned, I'm Geep. And uh, but uh, as I started to say a couple of days later, he says, Geep, did you notice how beautiful that blood was on my lap? And it froze before it oxidized. It wasn't the red like we normally. It was a beautiful bright orange. And I, I till he mentioned it, I really but. It had registered, mm -hmm. and I said, "That's true. It, you know, it really was. It was a, just a bright reddish orange, just a different color, but it mm -hmm. was bright and cheerful." Really. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and we we concluded that the reason was that it, it was cold enough that it froze almost instantly and mm -hmm. uh, froze before it had time to oxidize. But, I, I'm looking at um, some of your missions that you guys flew on here, a list of them, and I see that you guys flew. Um, some missions right around D-Day. What were some of your targets around D-Day? Oh, uh, actually, Bert flew D-Day. Uh, pilot always flew one mission as co-pilot with another crew. Mm -hmm. And then the rest, rest of us had at least one mission to fly with somebody else later on to catch up. And uh, so my, my first flight was D, D plus one, or D plus two, whatever. But, mm -hmm. It was supporting the uh, ground forces, uh, and you really couldn't see a whole lot of what had it. it was, so were you remember, taking out uh, artillery emplacements of yeah, bombing, or were you... Yeah. Okay. Or maybe rail yards or mm -hmm. supply uh, areas, or mm -hmm. different ones that had different 
different targets. But, uh, again, you can see all the mass of everything: <laughs> vehicles, boat, ships. You know the war, the bank, the bunkers that they had made out in the seas, and the, all the details of, of that have been, of course, pretty well documented since. And, mm -hmm. and again, we didn't know anything about them then, except what we could see. I mean. You know, didn't really know what all we were looking at. Mm -hmm. What was probably the most heavily defended city? The you, most what? Heavily defended city that Munich, you, Munich was. Yeah. And what was the target at Munich? Do you know what if the, it was? If it was a, just, I don't remember. You don't remember? Okay, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, their major, uh, but more, more for distance than anything, was our trip to Berlin. We did have a, a target up near Berlin on one occasion, mm -hmm. and uh, I've always felt that was partly in support of the Russian advance that we we did that with ground forces, and German ground forces. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the well, I guess one of the other things too was uh, I believe it was. Uh, well, it left had to have been, I was trying to remember, just a few days but after D-Day, but uh, I not material how much longer, but I know I bombed, uh, um, we had one target that I bombed within about 10 miles of my grandmother's hometown. Wow. My grandmother and grandfather were both born in Germany, we're only one generation. I corresponded with cousins till Hitler cut her mail off. So, some of the ironics of, of war. <laughs> so some of your extended family probably served in oh, the yeah. German military. I'm sure they did. Army. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, tried to, or did get in touch with a uh, great aunt on the phone one day. Um, just sideline real quick. I had an exchange student from Columbia, South America. Uh, for a year, American Field Service Exchange, and uh, Jaseet was here with us for that year. And AFS makes them have standards are they have to go home for uh, two years, but during that two years, his father died. We and he became as a son to our family. He came back and got his engineering degree at OSU, and then went back to Bogota, <coughs> got his master's there, uh, being bilingual and double degree, uh, got, oh, after getting his master's he either owed the government or work it out and when they found out his talents they went and put him to work. He ended up representing the Colombian government for two years in Berlin, in, bon, in Berlin on the International Department of Energy oh, wow. and we went over <coughs> to visit with my oldest son uh, when the state was ready to come home and uh, toured uh, with him. He met us in Amsterdam and then we were going back to uh, Bonn. I said Berlin, it was Bonn, uh, the capital. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the way back uh, he had stopped at a an big antique show in Cologne. And my wife was an antiquer. And, uh, happened to think that he hadn't confirmed our hotel reservations in Bonn. So we went to the phone to do that and I summoned through the phone book and here was a capelt spelt the right way. And I said, you see, you got to call them and see who they are. And it turned out it was a, a great hand. No kidding. And was very invalid, I guess. She didn't, obviously didn't want us to come out, but mm -hmm. told me of uh, a relation in in Berlin, and uh, when I got home, I took his ad name and address. And when I got home, I got our teacher of German at high school to write a letter for me. And I've written twice, but never did hear it have an answer. Mm -hmm. My sister has done a lot of genealogy, mm -hmm. and her husband had business in Europe quite a while, several times, and she get to go with him under their company policies, and so. She has found this gentleman's sons and visited two of them. One's a professor in one of the universities, and the other 
at what he did, but wow. it's kind of interesting. But. Sure. <laughs> well, we're pretty much out of time now. Yeah. Um, is there anything you'd like to add in closing um, that maybe well, we haven't I covered? Came, came back you know, when I discharged, went back to school, had a year to finish school, I joined the reserve, name only for two or three years, and they came out and said either get active or resign your commission. I got active and stayed in the reserve until I hit uh, 28 years commission service and had to retire. Wow. And, and wait to age 60 for full retirement. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm at. Well, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, we'll go ahead and stop the tape here, and then maybe I'll get another tape out. We can have you go through your photo album real okay. quick and kind of give you some descriptions on that. Thank good. you.